Well, I was a big fan of the book The Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett when it came out many years ago. Some of you are probably familiar with it. It's a book of fiction, but it describes in detail the making of some of the greatest cathedrals or the way that these cathedrals would have been built in the 1100s and the 1200s. The cathedral that's described in the book is totally fictitious, but that doesn't keep Ken Follett from dedicating about a thousand pages to the making of it. I learned so much from this book about Gothic architecture in particular. I'm going to show you some photos here of Gothic cathedrals that were built around the same time as what was being described in the book, around the 13th and 14th century. Just spectacular, stunning cathedrals. They were known for their sort of sweeping uh, architecture, those giant Gothic spires, the impressive heights that they had, pointed arches and columns, and just extraordinary stained glass windows that were meant to make us think of heaven from as we looked up into the, the vastness of the nave. The most famous is probably Notre Dame Cathedral. It was known as one of the finest examples of Gothic architecture with its flying buttresses that it had, its tall ceilings, again, with the light flooding in. And, uh, you know, kings have been crowned in Notre Dame Cathedral. Wars have shaken its walls, and thousands of tourists have flooded there day after day to see the beauty of Notre Dame Cathedral. And of course, we all know what happened in Notre Dame Cathedral just a few years ago. 850 years it stood before this fire. You remember the heartbreak of watching it burn? Even if you'd never been there before, which I never have, it was just heartbreaking to see. We didn't know if it could be saved. We didn't know how much of it would even be left. We were literally watching a piece of history disintegrate before our very eyes. There's a picture here, I think, of the nave uh, before. This is what it looked like before the fire. Look at that. And then this is what it looked like after, when the roof trusses burned and fell down into the middle of the nave. We had no idea if it would even be salvageable. Sometimes I think that it feels like little bits of our lives are disintegrating before our very eyes as well. Institutions, political parties, churches, whole systems, even our civil discourse seems to have gone a little haywire lately. Not one stone will be left upon the other. All will be thrown down. We are experiencing a reckoning of sorts in the world today. The pandemic, the war in Ukraine, racism in the United States, those are just some of the obvious areas of upheaval that we've been hearing an awful lot about lately, but there are others for sure. It's hard to avoid the news, especially when it's hard news. And then of course, we all have our own personal struggles that we're going through as well our own personal challenges. We are busy with so much in our brains, aren't we? It's just hard to take in sometimes. We get a little carried away at times. So then we get assigned a lectionary reading like today from the Gospel of Luke about the end of the days, the end times, earthquakes, famines, wars, insurrections, plagues. My gosh, this is the kind of language that made another book famous, by the way. If any of you ever heard of the Left Behind series, which was marketed to Christians, and another prime example that there's a lot of money to be made by selling fear to people. Because yes, Jesus did talk about these things in today's reading. He tells us everything we know and everything we place our trust in is going to crumble and fall. And then he has the audacity to tell us not to be terrified, which is, you know, easy for him to say. 
There are literally earthquakes, famines, wars, insurrections, and plagues happening all around us. But Jesus knows this is not the end. He says these things will happen, but it is not the end yet. In other words, there's a plan. There is a divine plan, and we don't even understand divine things. So we have to trust. Don't be frightened by what you see, but trust. Now, it's important to understand, too, that most modern Bible scholars agree that the events that Jesus was referring to in this morning's scripture have already happened. They, they happened not long after Jesus was gone, in fact. When he said, not one stone will be left upon the other, all will be thrown down, he was standing in the very temple that would be destroyed just a few decades later. There were people standing there with him in the temple that day, and they were in awe of what they saw. They were marveling at the beauty and the scale and the splendor of the temple that had been built. Not unlike the way we marvel at the cathedrals that I just showed you photos of. And we hear this same message in the Gospel of Mark, in the Gospel of Matthew, we hear about it here in Luke, we hear about it in the book of Revelation. And the message is this, the old will pass away but it will make room for the new. Something new is coming. It's a message for the ages. Whether it happened already or not is almost irrelevant because we know that it's happening still today. It's hard to escape that when we read this passage today. Powerful forces beyond our control create change and uncertainty. And in the midst of that, we have some choices to make. Do we respond in fear, in hope, in panic, in ignorance? Jesus has a message for us. He wants us to know a few things as we enter into times of uncertainty. He wants us to enter into these times of uncertainty in our lives with eyes wide open. The language in today's reading is a classic example of apocalyptic literature. And just to be clear, apocalypse is less zombie takeover and more uncovering things that have been unseen. Apocalypse literally means to uncover, to lift up the edges of something, even if we're scared or a little bit grossed out about what might be lurking underneath. It's an unveiling of truth. And sometimes the truth is ugly. Ugly, hard things do happen to us. We know this when we experience trauma. We know this when we receive a horrible diagnosis. When someone we love dies suddenly, unexpectedly, when relationships implode, when the hurricane or the fire decimates our homes and our livelihoods. Even though it's been over 20 years, we all remember the absolute shock and anguish, if we were alive to remember it, of 9-11, of watching those twin towers fall. Nothing is permanent. And that's not a threat, that's just the truth. And it's a truth that Jesus wanted to uncover for us, to make us aware so that we would be prepared, so that we won't be terrified when something happens. Because the greater truth, in fact, the greatest truth, is that when the old passes away, it leaves room for something new. When we experience hard things, our hope is that we're going to have something to grasp onto, something that's certain and lasting and permanent. That's what we want. We crave that. 
And we can't be holding on to things that will crumble and fall in the face of it. Even the people who love us the most and in the best possible ways cannot be our sole providers. The most lasting and permanent and sure thing, the best thing that we can cling to in those times is God. Which is why Jesus is saying to us this morning, watch out that you are not deceived by people claiming to be me, saying that the end is near. Jesus is emphatic on this one. Do not follow them. Many will come in my name, he says, shouting with contempt at people spewing lies, making up conspiracy theories, clinging to their earthly power and control. And Jesus says, I'm telling you right now, do not be led astray. Do not be led astray. There were a lot of people in Jesus' day claiming to either be him or to be leading in his name. But there was one key difference. None of them claimed hope and salvation and redemption from all the past ugliness and shame in our lives. They claimed fear. They proclaimed a gospel of fear, peddled it to anybody who would listen. And most of us have three basic responses to fear. Fight, flight, or freeze. Lately, we've been seeing a lot of fighting. Fear of losing power or control makes us say some crazy things, hurtful things to other people and about other people. Fear makes us follow people who espouse theories and things that are not even true and may in fact be downright bad for us. Fear puts us in the company of other people who fear and then we just ramp each other up. Fear makes us build walls and then stand on the precipice of those walls, armed and ready to defend what we have built. Maybe instead of trying to defend our fortresses around institutions and systems and power structures and ideologies and beliefs that we have essentially made into idols, it's time to let them go. Maybe it's time to ask ourselves, what walls need to fail? What stones need to crumble? And then to consider, who are you going to get in line with to help lead you out of the rubble? Listen again to the promise that we heard in our first reading this morning from Isaiah. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or even come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. Nothing will hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. God doesn't promise us that we're never going to experience pain or suffering. In fact, just the opposite. Jesus tells us pretty clearly that these things will happen. He says, you will be persecuted, you will be betrayed, but stand firm in what I am creating out of that. Stand firm no matter what. Better times are coming. No matter what, hope prevails. No matter what. Justice wins the day. I want you to hear what the prophet Malachi said when talking about the coming of the Messiah. And as a reminder, Malachi for Christians is the last book in the Old Testament. The very next words you read are from the Gospel of Matthew about the coming of Jesus, the birth of Jesus. So this is what Malachi said about justice. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, 
so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you, you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healings on its wings. This passage tells me two things. God's got it, and God's got me. God's got it. The arrogant, the evildoers will be stubble. They will be brought down. They will be humbled. Nobody loves justice more than God, and justice will prevail. And God's got me. God's got us. Stick with God. Do not be led astray. Revere the name of God, we're told, and righteousness will rise up and heal the broken places. God's got it. God's got me. I don't need to worry. But I do. I worry anyway. We are in the midst of significant change, change like nothing we've seen in our lifetimes. And rather than banding together to address massive upheaval and, frankly, opportunities for transformation, we continue to hear hateful rhetoric and contempt for one another. That bothers me deeply. I am not always optimistic that we will get out of our own way and make real change in the world. But when I remember the words of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who said optimism and hope are not the same thing. Optimism is the belief, he says, that the world is changing for the better. Hope is the belief that together we can make the world better. Optimism is a passive virtue, he says. Hope is an active one. Hope takes action. It needs no courage to be an optimist, but it takes a great deal of courage to hope. The Hebrew Bible, he finishes his quote here, the Hebrew Bible is not an optimistic It is, however, one of great literature of hope. It is the literature of hope from start to finish. Not just the Hebrew Bible, what we Christians would call the the Old Testament, but all the way through the New Testament to the very end, from Genesis to Revelation, it is a story of hope. The belief that together we can make a difference that through our active participation and cooperation with God, we can transform people and places, that together we can fight injustice. I even dare to hope that together we can rid this nation of the scourge of uncivil discourse that we're experiencing, because I truly, truly believe that we don't mean half of what we say when we say it behind each other's backs. It's just easy to spew words of hate and shame when we're not face to face with somebody. It's hard to hate close up, as Brene Brown is fond of saying. It's also harder to hate, I believe, when we're not being led astray by someone or something that isn't of God. And here's how you know. If it isn't loving, it isn't of God. It just isn't. God loves you with the full being of God's self. Nothing you can do can change that. This is a God who is about to create a new heaven and a new earth. Yes, at the end of the world, but also at the end of the world as we know it. Because it's a God who wants you to rejoice and be glad forever, as we just heard read. This is a God who says nothing will be able to hurt or destroy you forever. That's why we're called to repent and turn back to God so that we can live a life that is worthy of rejoicing over. Not out of fear, but out of the hope that we can actually get there, that we can live that life worth rejoicing over. We all go through hard things. 
people we love and adore will perish. Someday we will perish. That's the reason Jesus doesn't want us to be led astray. That's why he doesn't want us to be terrified even when everything crumbles around us. That's why he says, don't worry about when this might happen because when doesn't matter. What matters is that we hold on to God in the midst of it. I could say to you, hold on to God because that's the only way you're going to get through hard things. But I think in the end, we hold on to God because only God gives us the eternal hope that everything God touches will be made new, including you and me. Amen.